All righty, morena tato. No my hari mai ki strategy operations and finance committee hui of the 16th of November. Welcome to councillors, community board members, mana whenua partners, and also members of the community who are here alongside us today to speak or also to listen in to the corridor that we'll have um, on on what is a relatively short agenda today, but there's obviously a lot of interest in a couple of the items on it. So um, thank you to staff also for the preparation that's gone into what we'll be discussing today uh, and all the hard mahi. So to kind of formally open up our hui, I'll pass to Andre Baker of Te Ati Aoki Whakarungatai for a karakia. A tēnā koe e Sophie koutou mā ngā rangotiro te kaunihira o Kāpiti, kei te whakamininga, e hui tahi nei, i tēnei ata nei rātami i kia koutou. Te hono re he kroori a he mau ngā rongo ki te whenua, he whakaaro pai ki ngā tangata katoa, tuturu ki a rongo whakamaua ki a tēnā. Huye. Kia ora Andre, thank you. We have uh, another brief item under item number two on our agenda today, the Council Blessing, which is the Tino Ranga Tiratanga flag. So you may notice that behind us we now have the New Zealand flag and we used to have two New Zealand flags, but just this morning we have um, decided to, off the back of some rangatahi coming in and speaking to us who were here as part of their college work day, and it was a request that was specifically made from them that we worked through kind of the practicalities of with our mana whenua partners and also how meaningful it would be um, and what it would symbolise. And so, yeah, today we, we have a bit of background on our agenda as to the reasons behind hanging both the, the New Zealand flag and also the Tino Ranga Tiratanga flag. But I would also like to um, invite Hara Adams, our iwi partnerships general manager, to make some brief comments. Kia ora, Hara. Good. Oh. Um, morena tatau. Um, ngā mihi nui kia tatau katoa kua hui hui mai nei te atanei. Um, so just a brief overview of um, the whakamārama or what um, the outline of what the flag expresses. Um, going through the three different colours, the black represents... Sorry, you know, you're okay, you're right. Um, te kore, the realm of potential being. The white is te ao marama, um, and the koru in its shape represents um, new life. Um, the red on the bottom is te whaiao, and also representative of Papa Tuanaku. Um, so the request coming through from the rangatahi was tabled at Tiwok and we decided to have a karakia this morning and just put it up. And so that's what we did. So, um, yeah, tēnā koutou. Cool. Kia ora, Hara. And as mentioned, there is some ba more background in the agenda as well, which you're welcome to um, read and reflect on in your own time. But just a massive shout-out to Pearl, Amelia, uh, Arthur and... There was one of the rangatahi, Esme, Esme, the four rangatahi who came in, and Inkira too, who came in and kind of put this wedo, this challenge to us as to how we could better reflect our partnership under Tatiriti in our council chambers. And this was one of the things they identified, and it's a challenge and a wedo that we've taken up. So um, massive mauri order to, to them. So moving on to item number three, apologies. We have an apology from Councillor Shelley Warwick. Community board member Michael Moore, Councillor Kathy Spears, and we have Councillor Liz Coe online, Councillor Jocelyn Pravanov online, Councillor Wilson, Councillor Nigel Wilson online, and also I think community board member Simon Black, and Councillor yeah Councillor Cooper as well. Can I have someone to move those apologies? Councillor Halliday, seconded. Deputy Mayor Kirby, all those in favour? Aye. Against. That is carried. Moving on to item number four, declarations of interest relating to items on the agenda. Haven't been made aware of any, so we'll keep moving. And on to item number five, public speaking time for items relating to the agenda. So we have a few public speakers. Uh, and first up, I'll invite Hamaima Wirimu and Rangitopiora Wirimu to korero on item 8.2, the asset management plan for beach access phase. Um, kia ora koroa, you've got five minutes. Um, just, oh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko he maima wiramu, tōku ingoa. 
Kia ora koutou ko, ko rangi tōpio tōku ingoa. Uh, we are here this morning to speak on behalf of um, I guess Ngā Hapu Otaki and also some of the wider community of Otaki um, in regards to the beach access at Otaki Beach. We've seen a concerning increase in the beach access and what we've seen as a part of that is it's that, uh, sort of a, a non-regulation of the bylaw. Um, so in particular we've we've noted a, a large increase of vehicle access on the beach around people who are trying to enjoy the beach, but also fishing right out of their boots, their cars, and quad bikes and um, other vehicles driving on and around and over the sand dunes, which are already sensitive ecosystems. Um, this has had an effect on the um, pippy beds. In particular, we've noted the drop in numbers of pippy beds, and um, it's also caused quite big distress to a lot of the coastal birds that we know are nesting there. Um, we were sent by Mike a copy of the Beach Access Asset Plan, I think it's referred to it, it might be under different terminology, um, and invited to sort of speak to if we had any feedback or insight around this plan itself. So I had a look at this plan and some of the other plans that I am aware of are underway within the Kapiti Coast region and also having a look over some of your social media and um, other avenues of public kind of communication and comms. And I think there appears to be a lack of integration between a number of them, um, where in particular on social media sites, for example, a lot of the posts that Kapiti Coast District Council promote Kapiti Coast as a place to holiday and relax and enjoy, but don't necessarily alert our community and people who are visiting to the risk and the concern that's a part of what we're seeing with the increase of numbers. Um, I've seen that with the beach access, the beach asset plan, I apologise, I might get the wording wrong. I'm trying to be concise because I've got five minutes. Um, <laughs> there's not a lot of consideration between that and what I've known to unfold as part of the Takutai Kapiti plan as well, with the climate resilience arrangement that's happening as well. Um, so really we're just trying to alert you all to the very real risk that will only increase, particularly over the summer. We are, we are primed to have a very warm, long summer and if we don't address the access to the beaches, not just here but continuing along the Kapiti coast as well, not just all Tucky Beach, we are going to see a drop in a drop in very real risk in the ecosystems and the biodiversity on our coast. Um, we are going to see a drop and um, in the numbers around our Kaimwana, um, but also it has we have seen and the risk is the what's the term for it just the raru between our communities, not necessarily our community internally, but the ability for locals and mana whenua to appropriately manaki visitors. Um, it creates tension. And because it hasn't been regulated and isn't being regulated, there is, there's, there's potential for risk and, and concern, very real concerns this summer. If we're having an increase of visitors and out-of-towners come in along the coast using our beaches the way they have been, and we don't have the opportunity or the ability to communicate and put these concerns out there. People are showing up unaware of the risk that they're contributing to. Um, there was another point I had to make as well. There's, there's, a, there's been a huge increase in freedom campers, particularly along Waltaki, um coast. We're seeing, I think legally there's supposed to be at any one time six vehicles staying over for a total of two nights. And over the last couple of weeks, I've gone down to the river mouth, particularly this is where a lot of the campers are, and I've gone down there several times a week, and I see at least 10 at any given time staying, which means that the space isn't being regulated. The signage isn't effective and is um, hard to read. So there's a lot more that could be done in terms of the communication that we're putting out for the community and for visitors as well. And there's also a lack of manpower on the ground to regulate and manage this. We're seeing a lot of our locals go out to try to address this themselves, um, and it's unsafe. So the concern is with the ecosystems that are at risk there, the climate risk as well, 
um, the, commun the community risk. There's a need to have more presence on the ground in these spaces to be able to speak on behalf of the community and mana whenua to address this. Kia ora, Warren. I think I covered everything. <laughs> <All good. laughs> and very articulately, articulately too. Look at me, I can't even, can't even speak. So, yeah, well done. That was awesome. And thank you so much for coming in and, and kind of sharing your perspective and also, yeah, what you're hearing from others on the ground and also what you're seeing uh, in Wataki Beach. So it's much appreciated. Are there any questions from the table? Councillor Halliday. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for coming in again, ladies. Um, I saw you at Te Whakamenanga Okapiti doing a presentation as well. Um, so I appreciate the follow through coming to the table here as well. Um, sure. you, you've noted that um, there's an increase in um, Freedom Campus, if you like, but generally over the last year, two years, have you, have you noticed this? What, what's, have you noticed this, a substantial increase in activity on Old Taki? Do you think, what, what do you think that might be down to? Maybe opening a transmission gully or? Um, well, it, I would put it down to at least the last five, to be honest. At last least. five years? Yep, at least. And I think it's a combination of um, the the Transmission Gully, but I also think it's to do with Tuanango Raukawa students. A number of these freedom campers come down, they camp down on the beach in their vans or in their caravans, and then they study at the Wananga. Um, and so that they're there for the study during the week, and then they wait until housing comes up and so that they can apply for housing around the winter time. So they'll camp out on the beach over the summer, along the coastline over the summer, and then they rent out the housing over the winter time if they can. Mm. So that's one significant risk. I've talked to, the last time I was down there, I spoke to four or five of the camping vans who would, who would kind of acknowledge I was hovering, and they were all students. Um, I do think that with Transmission Gully, and there's, there's you know, access to Otaki's better, and so it's faster and easier to get there. So that has had an impact. But that might be more holiday goers who come for public holidays. And th that's a bigger risk that we're seeing, um, I think, related to along the beachfront stretch, people who are parking up on the beach to fish for the day. And then they go home. Right. So it could be day trippers. You know, mm. There's certainly been an increase in people living in Old Taki. Yeah. Uh, there's yeah. no doubt about that. And it's just, it's just that much more accessible now yeah. um, as well. Um, I just had a question for officers, if that's okay, Madam Chair, in relation to this. I just wanted to know whether Greater Wellington uh, contributes to feet on the ground for policing these sorts of areas. Uh, kia ora. Oh, yeah. oh I no, don't have a mic through you, yeah. Chair. Um, Deanna and I have reached out to Greater Wellington through Monica Fraser um, in terms of um, finance, uh, putia, funding for that kind of arrangement. So we're working through possible options there at the moment. Um, and outside of that also the signage that um, Rangi Topiora mentioned is also being worked through with myself and Mike. And that might also be a question you can raise during that item on our agenda as well. Sure, no to get all of the staff. No, that's fantastic. Thank you, Councillor Halliday. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks, Hada. Councillor Kofis. <coughs> Thanks for coming in this morning. Uh, the estuary area is where the, uh, the Otaki River estuary is where the camper vans um, park out, isn't it? And there's, of course, we've provided a loo there, which is a, a great attraction. Um, the motorbikes and quad bikes um, ripping up the sand dunes is totally unacceptable. We've got the Waito, Friends of the Waitahu Valley, Friends of the Otaki River, mm. working really hard there, and mm -hmm. they're protected ecological areas, so that's unacceptable, and it must be stopped immediately. Cars on the beach, totally unacceptable with uh, children around there. They go to the uh, liquor store on the way. They're out of town generally. Um, I've just uh, done a, a, a trip overseas. Sure, Rob, just wanting to make sure there's a question. Yeah, no, um, yeah. would, would um, uh, something like a, uh, pay, uh, a barrier to the beach for vehicles, particularly over summer, and a pay and display car park. I think we should enforce, uh, put that in immediately and enforce it, have an officer there all the time, mm. at the very least. And um, I'd be in support of that, thanks. Right, thanks, Councillor Kofid. Yeah. Kim, Tahiwi. Kia ora koura, no Thanks for coming, because some of the things that you've raised are some of the um, questions that I had when we go into this presentation. 
and in, in particular around collaborating with um, local iwi experts or local taiao experts. And as you said, there's the many groups and getting their feedback on how they think they could address it. And also I know there was feedback um, through the Takutai um, when we did the Takutai and those feedback sessions, there was some around around the same kind of kaupapa. But my question is around, you've obviously um, had a lot of thought and seen a lot of this going on. What would you suggest? What are your suggestions? What would you like to see um, us as a community and a council do together mm. to, um, you know, prevent or lessen this? Um, well, I guess the first and foremost is a bit more manpower on the ground um, and addressing presence on the ground. That's one of the first things. But also, like you say, it is about approaching the right um, tile experts, those with the right mātauranga Māori, um, who have whakapapa to this whenua. Because s some of the, the, the ecosystems that are at risk there are very intricate. And the knowledge that some of these these um, local these locals and, and some of our mana whenua have can assist in, in boosting some of these numbers and supporting this, this restoration. Um, Education, I, th I noticed this, I noted this at Te Whakamendi Mō Kapiti, but I think building a stronger substance of education around understanding the spaces you're moving through and, and what you're in actually engaging with and who is actually a part of that picture is important. Um, and also where and how all of these concerns are integrated and how it actually becomes a holistic concern towards our own well-being as community members. Um, whilst, you know, Ngā Hapu Otaki and Ngā Te Raukawa and Otaki are known for their pippies, and it's, 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 a, it's a source of mana for us, but it's also, we have an intimate relationship with the ecosystems there, and we're seeing it depleted severely very quickly. Um, so I think the first and foremost to answer your question, Kim, is Education on the ground, integrated education, a, an awareness to integrating your planning into the future, and manpower on the ground is the first thing. And seeing that applied and seeing a co-design process between mana whenua mm -hmm. for, that to, for that to kind of unfold. Kia ora. Kia ora. Great and, and yeah, good answer too. Mm -hmm. Mia Holbro. Kia ora, thanks so much for coming in today. It's a very good question. Would you be willing to front a video campaign on this? <laughs> Just the way you present it is so articulate and so meaningful. Oh no, Mum, do you want of, to... It's kind of a flippant <laughs> question, but I just think... Um, just, I just want to thank you so much for the, the passion and the, the meaning um, that, that goes into your kōrero. And, yeah, I think we're all touched by this today. And mm. as we kind of go through an agenda where we're very much focused on the operations and the maintenance and the kind of infrastructure we put in place. It's good to be reminded about that this is part of a more holistic picture mm. that we need to look mm. at across a whole lot of work streams and particularly as we go into probably what's going to be the busiest summer we've ever seen. Yeah. And I know that's not a question. Thank you for your <laughs> lead, Madam Chair. Yeah, not to put you on the spot either about the video co-buffer, but maybe a conversation we can have offline. <laughs> Uh, we'll go to Andre Baker and then Councillor Pravanov and Simon Black can see you both on Zoom. We'll just take one question from each of you if that's okay and then keep moving. Kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, tēnā kōrua, uh, maima, uh, ko Rangi Māori, uh, Rangi Tōpi uh, Two questions. Mm -hmm. is, is it conceivable that uh, we will need to consider putting a rahui on our pipi beds? And I'm saying that because 20 years ago, we faced the same trauma um, with people coming and taking tohiro, tohimanga. Mm. It would be 20 years ago that our elders decided that in order to protect that species of shellfish that we would implement a rahui, which means that when we go to Raukawa for significant occasions, the tradition and the reputation that we had in the past of providing tohimanga is no longer part of the menu. So that's the first question. The other thing that hasn't been mentioned is where's the role of police here? Mm. Because obviously on the beach, um, it's a road. And Aye. so policing needs to be a part of the partnership that we're wanting to form with community to ensure that they are policing that. It's mm. their jurisdiction. I've not heard any reference to them. And so 
I'm encouraging our elected members and the community that are here to consider having those conversations, either collectively or independently, about the role and the responsibility they have for protecting all of us. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in regards to the Rahui, I wouldn't be against it, personally. I think it's a broader conversation to have with all of our people, but I think to, given where the numbers are going, it might be necessary. I, um, in regards to the policing, um, that, that, that's been a tricky one because when one of our local our whanaunga called, called the police during Labor Day um, and the numbers the numbers were insane that day, it, was, it brought a tear to your eye kind of thing. The beach was a car park, the beach itself. And when she called the police, there was such a delay in getting a response. And that's just because it's not an immediate emergency to life. It's not life-threatening. So on a public holiday, they're potentially, and I'm just trying to put myself in their shoes understanding this system, yeah, they're potentially run off their feet. If they can't answer the call immediately, it goes back to the call centre and then a, a, a kind of a, um, I guess a tunnel's kind of put out to whoever's in the area to respond to it. But if they're all busy, it drops in terms of priority to whatever else they might have on. And so this is what happened, particularly at Labor Day. So the police aren't there to answer your question quickly. They're not policing this. They do have more responsibility to do that, to do this. Um, but then I think it becomes a bit more of a systemic and resourcing concern where there's not enough of them on the ground and there's not enough resource to, to, to support this. Uh, but no, they're not present when it comes to this particular issue. Kia ora. Councillor Pravanov on Zoom. Kia ora. Uh, thank you. Hi everyone, thank you very much for coming along to speak to this matter today. And so you've raised a number of issues. And I suppose the crux of this is that um, several years ago, we went through the beach bylaw process and there were lots and lots of questions raised about vehicles on the beach. And the decision was made to allow vehicle on the, vehicles on the beaches in some locations and unfortunately, this is probably the crux of the matter, and so we are stuck with that bylaw now unless we decide to, to renew it, because I'm certainly aware that um, in terms of the police, um, even if they are aware of this, it takes them a long time to get there, and so it can't be managed uh, particularly well. Um, I, I suppose also that um, as the chair of the Climate and Environment Subcommittee, we are just starting a process of looking at... at um, developing a, an environmental strategy and I think some of the points that you've raised here are really important to um, you know to, to get our heads around so it's not only there but also Jihoro Beach you've got the Waikai history about how we mm. look after our environments and it's not just only vehicles it's the, the quality of water that actually ends up from the beach from inland as well there's a whole lot of matters. Um, the other um, point I wanted to make too is in relation to freedom campers and so there are rules and regulations around that um, and I suppose that comes down to um, those areas being monitored because I think the maximum length of time is I'm not sure if it's 24 hours or 48 hours and then people should be moving on. Sorry so, Councillor Pravanov did you have a question? Yes yeah, so it's a case of where are staff monitoring these freedom camping areas or this particular freedom, camp, freedom camping area? No. No, not no. that I'm aware of, no. So it, so staff able to ask that, answer that question? I think maybe that's a question we can come to once we get to the report, unless the team has a quick I'm answer. I'm not sure whether it's now. covered in the report. Um, yeah, kia ora, kora, um, kia ora koutou. Um, probably the, the short answer is it's probably a, a regulatory matter to go into those sort of specifics. Um, but... There are a, or there is currently a Freedom Camping Ambassador that's gathering information on those sites that's been appointed um, and funded through external funding, and that is continuing. Cool. Thanks, Gareth. I can see Mike also, Mike Mendonca online, unmuted. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Now, I was just going to confirm what, what Gareth was saying is there, there is some enforcement, but it, it, it is... Um, uh, it is modest. Um, perhaps Mr. Jefferson will be in the room when we come to debate and he might be able to talk to that a bit more specifically. Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thanks, Councillor Provanov. Community Board Member Simon Black. Got a tattoo, Evelyn. Um, hey, look, thank you very much for raising this issue. Um, this was discussed actually on Monday at the Fire Brigade as well, um, mm. because we've been going to an increasing number of uh, fires at the beach, mm. and um, we can see that there's a huge increase in campers, um, white baiting as well, probably contributing. Um, and I think us as a council have conflicts um, of an agendas, for, you know, tourism versus environment. Mm. So um, I just want to support, there's no question for me, I just want to support the, uh, the points of view raised today and we've got a gap in our enforcement and uh, communications. Thank you. Kia ora, Simon, thank you. I'll just take one last question from Councillor Coford. Oh, thanks, Chair Sophie. And look, I'll just re-articulate my, my um, presentation Your before. question. Question. <laughs> How would the community feel if we um, got some immediate legislation in place, put a barrier to the beach for vehicles, and, okay, opened up more designated parking areas with pay and display? You drive, you know, from out of town to the beach, and you pay, and you don't go take your vehicle on the beach, and any quad bikes you know, disturbing the ecological sites would be um, immediately um, confiscated and crushed. <laughs> Crusher COVID. Hey, look, uh, yeah, how would the community feel about keeping vehicles right off the beach and you, pay, you go to pay and display? Well, I think there are two, two questions there. Um, I think around keeping, keeping vehicles off the beach, I'm all for that. I don't know about the pay and display. Um, I don't know why and how our people should have to pay to visit their beach and to be able to park, that, park there to visit. This is, we're talking about, I mean, I personally I'm talking about a community that whakapapas to that beach and they shouldn't have to pay to be there. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not for the pay and display, but I do think that if we are going to put barriers up, at the, up on the beach as well, I mean, it's, it's not even that... I mean, the, the, the access is there for boat launching, right? So if you had people who were just driving onto the beach to launch their boat and then parking back up in the, in the car park, not really an issue, I don't see. It doesn't create that much of a risk to the ecosystem around there. It's more you're seeing people abuse that bylaw and abuse that access to be able to play. And it's, it's, it's drawing a line there. It's drawing that definition. If you had... Um, people being able to still launch their boat off of the beach, it doesn't create a risk. They park back up in the car park. That should be free. And then you, you, you come back and you get your boat. But you're seeing people hoon up and down the beach, park, fish out of their boot. Absolutely, the quad bikes need to go. Um, crush yeah, crush, crush those ones. That's all right. But, you, you know, it's, 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 let's not all lump it all in the one issue here. But, yeah, kill them. Yeah, kia ora. Thank you. That's been a really interesting and fruitful corridor. And yeah, we look forward to weaving some of those points both through the item when we get to, to this on the agenda and asking further questions of staff, but also, um, as the Mayor said, the the kind of foundations to what you're talking about. And as Councillor Pavanov said, weaving that into our broader environmental mahi so that this is all integrated, which I love that you gave voice to. So thank you so thank much you. for joining us. Thank you. Kia ora. Kia ora. Alrighty, so we've got a couple more public speakers. So I'll invite up Roger Foley and Dennis Grant, who are going to speak to item 8.2 on the agenda, which is also the asset management plan beach access ways. So, yeah, yep, so feel free to come up to the table and we'll get you. Oh, the microphone's already all turned on, so you're, yeah, you're good to go. Thank you for this opportunity. We uh, were alerted to an item, this item on the agenda last yesterday afternoon, last night. Uh, so we have really haven't got time to uh, come up with facts and figures. And it's just very surprising that, that this has um, come to light without conversations being held with us and our other supporters in the room. The report you know, is, I don't know, I don't want to criticise or compliment people about it. 
it's well written, but I was alerted to the fact in November 22, March or February this, uh, this year that there was a gate to be put up at this entrance way. And I asked what, how is it going to be controlled and what have you. And they w couldn't tell me and they said that's to be disclosed at a future date. That's all I have to say at this stage. Madam Chair, can I just ask well, for some clarity? To, to speak. Sorry, just, just, just one, one moment, Councillor Halliday, really briefly. Sorry, gentlemen, I just wanted to clarify, um, Councillor might not be aware, this is in relation to the entrance at Manly Street, uh, the Manly Street entrance, um, uh, north end Paraparaumu Beach. Cool, thanks for that clarification. Apologies, right. carry on. Right, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, as Jenna said, this uh, the item on the agenda today regarding closing the uh, boat act for boat access at the uh, north of Manly Street uh, is on the agenda today, and that came as quite a surprise because, uh, well, as Councillor Halliday and Lady Chair will remember, I think it was a year or eighteen months ago we had this debate. The same thing came up with, regarding the bylaw which wanted to uh, close this access way. And uh, the boat users and local residents fought very hard and got the support of councillors on board and got our issues across and they decided in their wisdom to keep it open. And we left that decision. They omitted to leave the roadway open to disability access and in my mind, I haven't got anything in writing, we've been waiting patiently since this agreement for that to be reinstated. And now, hello, this has popped up on the agenda. I know this is through a different part of, of the council, but I'm not prepared at the moment properly for this meeting, but as you can see, there's a number of us here in a short term, but uh, certainly, we, we left the last discussions with an acceptance of uh, putting up with a gate, gated access, and at the time you were talk, the council was speaking about a gated access at the Paraparam Boating Club and Manly Street. Um, nothing's had or been said, and I have, I mentioned this to a councillor last night, and he said, <coughs> sort of, this isn't going to happen. The council, we're short of dough. Nothing's going to be spent. We need this Manly Street closed because it's costing us money. Well, that brings me to the point, costing you money. Um, does anyone here today could tell me the cost of keeping that access way for a year? I'm aware of this time last year, uh, approximately five cube of shingle was dumped in there and would have been consolidated. My estimate would be 500 bucks or say a thousand bucks. And the only other work that's been done on there, uh, contractors recently have been renewing the or or uh, maintaining the stormwater pipes. And there's been diggers and concrete trucks going, and um, they upgraded themselves. I'm not sure if it was on the council. Uh, uh, cost or just giving them access, but the uh, the main thing that's wrecked it is is the uh, these contractors. So it's, I don't think it's it's not a cost issue. Uh, the other issue that rears its head and uh, you hear it in the public domain is the access way for the Hoons and and also people driving down towards the estuary. The new uh, maintenance on the stormwater pipes has uh, restricted this and it's only possible to drive either way of the stormwater pipes at a very low low tide and by four-wheel drive. Having said that, there's people that do do it, not very many. Uh, I'm a white baiter, I've sat on the river for the last two months and the people here, but hey, there's no policing. Um, I've got a disability. I don't drive down to the white for white baiting, but I'll often drive across the entrance way to see if the sea's suitable to put my boat in, or I'll take drive onto the beach down at 
the boating club, Kia ora, sorry, and walk my dog. You're, we've just come to the end of your time, so if you could right, quickly well, you've wrap up. Right, we've got the gist. We don't want it closed. Yep. And we were worried that Heard it was that going to be a decision made today. Yep. Councillor Halliday assured me it won't be, but you know that we're here to fight it. <laughs> Making the big promises. And we're fellow supporters. Man, behind. where's that bus? Okay, thank, <laughs> thank you so much for coming in and speaking <laughs> with us. Thank you. I've had a, I've had a brief conversation with Councillor Halliday and also with... Um, Chris Pervan, GM Strategy and Growth, who is to my left, and thinking about some potential wording that we could pull together, which requests council staff to provide further advice on options for the Manly Street North boat ramp, item 5.4, as part of the asset management plan, as a boat launch before a decision is sought. So that would give us time to have further conversation and to understand the advice on which what's in the asset management plan is, um, yeah, is relying on. So I think Hopefully, we'll, we'll come to that once we get to the item on the agenda, but just to provide you with a little bit of reassurance that it is being factored in, um, the concerns today, that you have. You. Yep. Kia ora. <coughs> Councillor Halliday. Look, yeah, thank you very much for coming in, gentlemen. Uh, just one quick question. You talked to, um, uh, talk to uh, Stormwater Access for fixing infrastructure. How did they get onto the beach? Did they use that access way, or did they come in by some other way? Uh, use the access way. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Pravanov. Thank you, through the Chair. Thank you very much um, for you three coming in today and speaking. My question to you, and I assume that you are residents in that area, is how do you, do you use this access way and how do others use this access way from your observations? What do they use it for? I use it personally for... Uh, daily walks, boat launching, and that's about it for me. Thank you. Yeah, and it, personally, I, I walk it, I drive it as I own it up to, apparently illegally, to look at the beach. It's not police, but, uh, but major, I want... I want to launch my boat there. That's why most residents bought their house, and that's uh, for boat launching. And uh, really, we need to. If there's a, we know there's a problem with hoons at night, guy fox, and that. But there's there's no sign of any policing, and uh, I'd be interested to see the records for the last 12 months to see if the, anyone has been fined for driving on the beach. Thanks, Councillor Pravanov. Thank We've you. Got thank you. Glenn Olson. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, what your feeling would be if this bylaw actually is at a point where it should be reviewed and it should actually be reviewed to see if um, the community wants it to officially become an accessible beach again as well as a boat ramp. And I'm just wondering what your feeling on the community would be if it was reviewed with the view of widening it and not actually <coughs> instead of restricting it. You've got restrictions there of the area between the stormwater pipes, of course, which you say there's probably 20 trailers maximum in the season there, so there's still plenty of beach. Hmm. Um, we're still getting picnic. It's, it's coping with... It's not big enough to open up to the public, but that'll be it. At, at your discretion, but obviously we've got the problem. Our population, people-wise, is increasing, screaming. Our boating population is is screaming, and people going to the beach. The main access is Paraparamu Beach Club. That's the gateway to Cavity Island. That it's the gateway for two tourist boats going out there multiple times a day. You've got one commercial fisherman that I'm aware of that's fishing out of there daily. And when the seas calm, there's 100 to 150 boats fishing out of there. So we're really restricted. Rao Matty's, you know, just similar distance down the down the road. They've got a concrete boat ramp there. Mm. I'm not sure how that's used or how it's policed. But we're certainly short of access way. But our concern is, uh, I came to the area six years ago, bought my house because the boat ramp was there, and I'm aware of uh, my colleague here, colleagues behind me uh, living there, hmm. paid extra 
for their homes, paying top dollar rates, and uh, we don't want to lose a facility that's already there. If you mm. want to increase what we're allowed to do there, fine. Mm. But we don't want to go backwards. Yeah. Um, and one last one. Um, as a white baiter um, or white baiting community, if that ramp was closed, do you think there's a risk of people trying to drive from the boat club down down there? Because it is possible to drive all the way down there, and would no, no, you risk I, people I don't trying think that? so, because the stormwater outlets uh, are preventing people driving to Waikanae Estuary and the Scientific Reserve. And um, Yeah, although I do see, because I, I go down there a lot, I do see four-wheel drives just going in front of them, driving right the way down. So, is there, you know, which are generally the white baiters from what I've During seen. During the white bait season, I would say there's probably four vehicles that are there, not every day, not regularly, but probably the same four that are there off and on throughout the season. Uh, they're coming from the Waikano side. Um, there'd be that. double, yeah. double that because of the way the river flows this season. And of course, where the, the birds nesting and all that is over there. But police looks pretty silk. The estuary committee we've got, the councillors will be well aware of the guy that that's uh, in charge of that and takes photos of everybody and brings a council every five minutes to get their help. Mm. Um, but I was, I was there on a Sunday and a guy had come down in a ute, uh, white baiting, drove right right down and the next thing, you know, half an hour later, the, the council ute, the Sunday council ute came down, drove all the way down and, and uh, just gave the guy a warning, which, hey, didn't worry me pers personally, but he just answered the call out. And I just had him on for driving on the on the history himself. And he said, "Hey, it's bloody son. I'm only giving this guy a warning because I don't want to do any paperwork today." Uh, you know, this is the sort of policing that's going on, so it's bullshit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yep. Great. Kia ora, thank you, Glenn. We'll have to keep moving along. Yep. Me yeah, Mia so, Sorry, just really quickly. Thank you for coming in today. And it's always hard when change happens and and this kind of thing happens, particularly if you don't know about it and it's affecting your, what you do on a daily basis. Just just based on what you said, I just want to quickly make sure that you know that it will, will still be a pedestrian access. So the, bit, the bits about walking the dog or making it accessible, all that stuff, that won't change. The only thing that's going to change from my reading of the papers is that you won't be able to launch your boats there anymore. And so I just wanted to ask you, how far is the drive to the next boat launching ramp and how much would that impact on you? I just want to understand the impact because there's a lot of reasons why we should close it. The hooning on the beach, the fact that you're not allowed to drive there, um, the fact that it's um, it costs quite a lot of money to keep it going when there's arguably a, beat ramp, a, a launch ramp just down the road. So I'm just wanting to understand what that impact would be on you to have to drive to the next boat ramp to launch your boat. I, um, I live one property away from the access way. Um, I've had that property for over 45 years and we've always used it you know, with the kids, taking down the surfboards or the canoes and the aluminium dinghies, etc. Now, if that was closed, um, I think I would be forced to sell the boat because it's about two kilometres back down the road and there's probably 150 boats being launched there. Two and kilometres back up. Mm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm in my 80s now, so you know, it's going to be really restricted for me. And if council were going to close that, I would like to see a barrier put across with either a padlock or a uh, combination lock which could be given to the 15 or so boaties and we that would uh, restrict that access definitely from there. <coughs> As to the cost, um, the note here was around $2,000. Well, 15 boaties at $150 each, that's $2,250, isn't it? So um, I would feel, uh, I wouldn't mind chipping in for that, for that maintenance just to keep the boat ramp open. But the main thing is to have a lockable barricade if council go that way, but able to be serviced by the, by the boaties. That's really helpful, thank you. It's very important to me and all our colleagues, 
exactly the same argument that we've got. Uh, family shoots you. You, you, know, you see birds, you want to duck out, do a quick fish on a tide change, clear your crayfish pot, and you can, you're going out three or four times a day. That's what bat trainers at beaches mm -hmm. do. Um, it's, it's just overcrowded out of the boat club mm. now, mm. and it's getting bigger, it's getting huge. And of course it's a gateway to Kapiti now too. Yeah. If you're down there at three o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday trying to get in or out, it's just impossible. Mm. And and the cost that was mentioned, uh, two th it was wasn't two thousand dollars annually. The council suggested it was two thousand dollars after each uh, bad weather incident, which is total rubbish. Because if you have a look in your records, I'm sure you wouldn't have spent more than fifteen hundred bucks on that trip trip in the last twelve months. Councillor Pravano, final question from you. Uh, yes, my question is, could they please re um, repeat their responses because you can't hear online? Oh, sorry, I think it was the, the gentleman on the end who was slightly further away from the microphone. Um, yeah, could you... <laughs> we'll, we'll pass it down and could you just, in about 30 seconds, just summarise the points that you made? Apologies. I would like to invite yeah. the councillors and the council staff um, that are interested or have something to do with this to actually arrange a, a conversation on site at yeah, we a can... convenient time. Yeah. Nice suggestion. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Cool. And maybe just make sure that if there's more than one speaker that the, um, the mic is moved along. Yeah, noted. Thanks, Councillor Pravano. Thank you. All right, thank you all for coming in and speaking, and we'll get to this item uh, second on, yeah, on our agenda. Thank you. So Wayne, Wayne Mitchell, did you want to speak? No, I didn't. Cool. All right. Jan Nisbet, welcome up to the table, speaking to item 8.3, Asset Management Plan, Recreational Tracks and Trails. You've got three minutes and then there may well be questions. Okay, hello. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for the work you people do. Um, I'm here representing the Cycleway, Walkway, Bridleway Advisory Group, which is uh, obviously an advisory group to KTDC. And that started in 2002, so many years ago. And I've been on it for 20 years. And I've seen a huge improvement in our tracks. Um, <clears throat> I note, or we note, that the Climate and Environment Subcommittee passed a recommendation to increase investment and coordination across our tracks and trails and cycleways, um, and they did that. And our concern at that meeting, we spoke to that meeting, was that there was no capital expenditure put against the budget. Um, and the, the document has come again and there's still no capital expenditure. And as a group representing people with disabilities, accessibility, open spaces, bikes, horses, definitely not cars, um, walking, we're really concerned that there's things in our network that will need doing and it needs some money. So. The CWB network is our major economic resource, tourist attraction. It provides well-being for our residents and provides a vehicle for economic development um, through visitors. That's a known fact. We, <coughs> we know that TG has brought more and more people to our, um, use our tracks, and we know that 5,000 users in the first month um, used in winter used the PP to O track. There's lots of data missing, and I know last committee said, please, could we have more? Well, that's the sort of job that a coordinator of CWB will um, be able to talk about. Um, <clears throat> we have launched this vision of going further into the backcountry so that we would have lowland, we would have midland, and then right back in the Akatarua and the Tararua, we can link up tracks. It's 
Sometimes things are right there looking at us in the face and we don't see it. And now people have just seen it and here's a real possibility. And now from the international airport and people, this could be a really big tourism thing. And the idea is to set up a trust. But a trust would be full-time involved, takes time to set up, and it would be full-time involved with um, out there in the back country. This track could be similar to the old Ghost Road. It could be similar to the Paparaz. It could bring lots more people and lots more economic development here. Um, what we're asking for is uh, for the next few years, yes, set up a trust because that will um, be able to source other fundings, hopefully. I guess John Key put a lot of money into it, so we've now got another national government. So it could be good or it could be bad. We don't know. But we can't just put all our um, eggs in the trust basket. We need to have both a CWB coordinator and a trust. Um, <coughs> Sorry, Jan, that, that is actually your time up. So if you could just maybe take 30 seconds to yeah. wrap up and then we'll ask some questions. On page 86, there are some standards, uh, levels of service. Um, our tracks don't, none of our tracks come up to the standards that they should be. And it's saying that the plan is to bring these tracks up to standards, but that needs capital expenditure. So it just so it just doesn't make sense to us, and we're really worried about all the extra work that is being um, put on to people in the open spaces. We know things have happened there. We just really want you to reconsider what's been presented, and maybe there's another direction that we can go. Thank you. Kia ora, Jan. And just to note, we will be popping this into all of the recommendations around the asset management plans that we've got on our agenda today, if, if it's supported by the table, just to note that no decisions with financial implications are being made today. So we're not counting in or out further investment in our tracks and trails or wider network. And that's a conversation that I know a few of us are really keen to push through the long-term plan process as well. So looking forward to having CWB's input into that process alongside this. Councillor Pravanov. Oh. Through the Chair, thank you, Jan, for coming along today. Um, I just want to ask, as a member, of, as you are a member of the CWB, I've got a couple of questions in um, that advisory group that you're representing. So in our, um, on page 73 in our report about today, it says that the recreational parks and trails is a subsidy to the CWB. But then in um, point, um, paragraph five below that, it says this asset, asset uh, management plan does not cover transport assets such as roads, cycle lanes, and shared paths attracting Waka Katahi subsidies, which is part of the CWB. So my question is, um, when you have your CWB meetings, do you actually, um, is other tracks and trails that are being discussed in this paper part of um, what you discuss, or that covered off in council somewhere else? Okay, I think I can <clears throat> answer you. Um, tracks such as the Fodimaku, which is considered to be a transport link between Potapuramu and Raumati, it's off road, but that's considered under transport. Um, other things that are on-road things that affect walking and cycling and cycle lanes, that's considered under transport. But one of the problems is that there's only about 40 kilometres of, la of land that is actually councils, and much of the land that is used in our network is um, GW, DOC, or sometimes there's private um, access. So what we have had with the coordinator is somebody who we could feed that information into 
they would then disseminate the questions to either the transport people or they would keep it themselves because they were the ones that mainly dealt with the, um, the, the recreational tracks. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so what you're saying is that the CWB only um, considers those matters that get half funding with Waka Katahi and that the, um, the tracks and trails is dealt with by other parts of council. N no, no, they oh. <laughs> no, they were originally um, up till the end of the time Stu worked, Stu Kilminster, they were they were dealt with under one person, and then um, when things happened, the the jobs that the council staff have done their absolute best, but it has been split up. And what right. we are concerned about is that yes. in the splitting up, things are falling through the cracks. Um, right, okay. Kia ora, Jan, yes. I can see yes. Mike, Mike Nick is online Mike, and has unmuted. Mike, I'll pass thank, thank you. Thank you, Jan. You, Jan. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just to explain, the CWB a advisory group, if you have a look at its terms of reference, it covers the whole network, but both the Waka Kodahi stuff and the recreational stuff. The asset manager plan you have before you today is a subset of that is just the recreational ones that do not attract the, the Waka Kodahi um, subsidy. It, it can get a bit confusing because there are off-road trails that are funded by Waka Kodahi because they are useful for using, but the advisory group itself, if you check its terms of reference, does have oversight of, of the whole lot. Thank you. Uh Okay, so then has the CWB considered um, th this report or the asset, the asset management plan that we have before us today? So the advisory group um, has had input into it uh, from its inception and, and indeed we discussed it um, a little bit uh, was it earlier this week, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Kia ora, Councillor Wilson. I don't see any other questions, so we'll just go with Councillor Wilson and then... Oh, thanks for that. The, um, uh, thanks, Jen. Look, I I agree that um, our bridleways, cycleways, walkways uh, are significant contributors to the kapiti economy, and there's a difference between spend and investment. And it seems I take your point about capital investment. Has CWB uh, run any numbers about what sort of what sort of dollars are required? Uh no, because <laughs> um, that's CWB advisory hasn't, and because we have not had a CWB person uh, working on this full time, for, you know, a designated CWB person since oh quite some time, that's what they have done in the past. So we are in a bit of a situation where we're saying, we, as members of CWB advisory, we actually know there are things coming up where we will need some capital expenditure, expenditure to make links, etc. Um, so we are saying that the situation can be fixed. We've got this vision. We need to get uh, a trust set up. And luckily, there's lots of good information that we can access through access Aotearoa for that. Um, but we also were asking council to reconsider or to consider continuation of the coordinator of the CWB network because it is district wide and it is something that brings money in. Kia ora, thanks Councillor Wilson. We'll have to move on now and thank you so much Jan for coming in and speaking. We'll get to this at item 8.3 on our agenda. So we appreciate your energy and time as always and your passion for our tracks and trails and wider CWB network. So thank you. I'm thanks going to go for... and mend bikes now <laughs> for the bike library. <laughs> the bike library, amazing. Awesome. Sorry, we do have two more public speakers who I think will come up to the table together. So we've got Paul Clark and Helen Punton. Oh, and okay, I, I actually thought that you would potentially come up with Roger and Dennis as part of their group, but we can, yep. That's okay, you'll be next, Bernie. We'll hear from you, we'll hear from you next. All right, over to you, you've got three minutes and then just brief questions from the table because we are running a little bit low on time. So if you yeah. can I just say, Paul and I were not... We didn't intend to be put down as dual oh. speakers, and I've got my little spiel written here, which I'd love to get in that's in three okay. minutes. Is that okay? No, that's fine. That's okay. That's fine. Yeah. Oh, kia ora tātou. Mihi ana. 
a ki te kai karakia, mihi ana a ki te tangata i whakatau, uh, mihi ana ki a tātou. Um, Paul Clark is my name. Um, I live at the northern end of the beach, and I'm, my concern about closing the gateway is in relation to health and safety. That part of the beach can only be accessed by that northern entrance. If there's an accident on the beach, there's no way for emergency vehicles uh, to be able to get into that part uh, of the beach. And so it's really a big health and safety risk. Um, I'm also concerned about the exclusive kind of nature uh, of putting a gateway and giving keys to local boat owners. It kind of means that only if you've got a boat can you access that part of the beach. There are disabled people from outside of our community that wouldn't be able to get into that part of, of, of the beach, and that's a deep concern for me. This idea of uh, getting people to pay for parking seems to be another kind of level of exclusivity. It's only if you've got the money to be able to go to the beach that you should be able to go to the beach. So, you know, I think the, there needs to be some deep consideration given to whether or not we put up an ex, a, a gateway there. I think it's restrictive of disabled people. There are a number of people that walk past uh, dragging dinghies uh, and taking them down that gateway into the beach. You would stop people being able to do that and to take them from that end of town down to the boat club is, you know, a good two plus kilometres distance and they wouldn't be able to do that. That's further restricting people's access to the beach. It's only then going to be people that are rich enough to have a car and a trailer and a boat to be able to tow their vehicle to the other end of the beach. People have spoken about hoons being on the beach and picking up bottle store, uh, bottles from the bottle store. Uh, you know, I don't see that. I go to the beach every single day and everybody that goes, past my, uh, goes to the beach has to go past my house. I can tell you that you could count on one hand the number of people that are going down there and abusing the privilege of being on the beach. It's ridiculous to suggest that, you know, that it's, it's mainly hoons that are going down there and, and ruining that area for everybody else. Yeah, that's my comment. Thank you. Kia ora. any questions for Paul? Yeah. Councillor Pravanov, one quick question. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm aware that um, some people are accessing um, the southern end of the Waikanae estuary. Um, if that beach access was closed to vehicles, um, what would stop them from accessing that estuary area from, um, from Manly Street where the boating club is there? Look, I can say that there's only a really short window of time when people are able to get down to the estuary, and that would be a couple of hours over the low tide period. When the tide is at medium height or at high tide, there's no way you can get to the estuary because the, the stormwater pipes extend too far for a vehicle to be able to get past. And okay. as uh, Roger, one of the earlier submitters said, you know, there are um, only a couple of vehicles that are doing it anyway. And if you were to stop them, then I think you'd, you'd solve the big problem there. Thank you very much. Kia ora, thank you. I don't see any further... Oh, oh just, sorry, just Councillor Clifford, one, one quick uh, question. Yep. Cheers, Sophie. No, thanks for coming. Uh, would it be helpful if you um, liaised with your community board, your Paparamu community board, because I was referring to problems we're having at Altaki Beach, and uh, we could liaise with the Altaki community board. Would that be helpful? We, we, we don't have a problem in our part of town. All right, kia ora. Thank you, Paul. Helen, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, there are some issues that you raise um, with this access way that I'd like to address. Um, you say the Coast Guard doesn't use it. They never have, and I, I think that that comment in there was sort of irrelevant. Um, the fire service do, emergency medical staff do, um, your stormwater management team does, having recently spent a lot of time taking heavy vehicles through the access way. My question is, will they drive the length of the beach next time at low tide to get to that area? Um, because the erosion's only going to continue. Um, 
This is a very useful access point to the beach. If there are fires or dune fires from fireworks, it's an important one for us to save our properties. The gradient of the access way is determined by the grader driver. At the moment, it's a hump. It could easily be scraped down to a gradual incline. The access way, or ramp as you call it, is 500 metres from the Waikanae estuary. In fact, it's getting closer every day as the erosion worsens and the river mouth is left to head south. As Dr Shan said, should the management practice of mouth cutting be discontinued, the inlet will return to its southernmost configuration. And given, given that your stormwater infrastructure is being affected and you've just spent over $80,000 on it, perhaps an approach to Greater Wellington Regional Council to find out why they will not cut despite having an open consent from DOC and the mouth being significantly further south than it was in 2001 when it was last cut 22 years ago. There are many boats that use this ramp, so it's being used for its intended purpose. I noticed that you said it wasn't being used for its intended purpose. I know this because I live on the access way entry um, next to Paul and my lounge and living room look out onto it. So to say it's seldom used to launch boats is completely untrue. Um, and could KCDC please qualify a number of service requests? A number is a number. It can be two, it could be 10, it could be 2,000. So how many service requests have been made and for what? Um, to claim vehicles are damaging the dunes is ridiculous. They don't drive up on the dunes. They can't because the dunes are now too steep due to the river moving south. Uh, when I moved in 21 years ago, there were cars down there in all hours. I was kept awake at night and I sleep well now. Maybe it's the height of the dunes too because the, um, the beach is lowering with every tide. Um, but there doesn't seem to be an, an extreme increase in bogans on that beach. Um, you know, I'm a light sleeper. I hear them. Um, this access way serves the community. It is used by a lot of people to launch boats and kayaks. Um, the, K the Kapiti Boating Club is not one kilometre away, as stated in your literature. It's actually 1.9, according to Google Maps this morning. Um, so in drafting these potential changes, the full facts should be given and no generalisations or guesstimates. It is very disappointing to see KCDC is focusing on reducing amenities and trying to reduce services to the community. That's me. Kia ora, thanks for, for bringing that, um, yeah, kind of supporting information. It's also really useful because all of the speakers are kind of living either very near to or... Um, or in the vicinity of this, this, so you see how it's used and how it's not. So that's really useful insights to have and appreciate you bringing those to our attention. Any questions from members of the committee? I don't see any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks both. All right, now Bernie Randall, welcome up to the table and noting that Bernie is here in his capacity as a member of the public. Um, and not as a community board representative. And Bernie, you've got three minutes to speak. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm saddened by the proposal to close off access to the Manly Street North boat ramp. It will be a bad and poor decision. It was only recently that the regulatory team consulted on the new beach bylaw, as we've heard from other speakers. Community feedback at the time was to keep the access open. Vox Populi, listen to the people. The regulatory team listened and they allowed the um, access way to remain open. Now another department, Parks and Open Spaces is having a go at closing the area. Sad, really, sad. Where is the letter from the Department of Conservation strongly supporting the closure? Strongly? Will they write that in a, in a letter? Frequent damage in recent years, evidence, and, a, and as the previous speaker mentioned, um, spokesperson mentioned, service requests. How many have there actually been? Um, I have a friend who lives right down on the beach, and he says in recent times there's hardly been any um, problems there, as the, the lady previously just mentioned. So he said it's not a problem. So a sad, sad day for the community that such reports are on the agenda without community input. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Bernie. Are there any questions from the table? No? 
there don't seem to be any questions. So thank you again, Bernie. Appreciate it. All right, so that concludes item number five, public speaking time for items relating to the agenda. And again, thank you to members of the community who have come and, and spoken um, all very articulately on different topics. It's much appreciated that you're engaging in this way and we hope you'll continue to do so. It's great. Um, and fingers crossed we can find a way of addressing some of the concerns that have been raised as well. So we'll, we'll get to that as we move through our reports. Item number six, members' business, leave of absences, haven't been made aware of any, um, so we'll carry on, and matters of urgent nature also have not been made aware of any, so that takes care of item number seven, item number six, sorry, item number seven updates, there are none, and so now we come to item number eight, reports. Just a reminder too of our strategy operations and finance tikanga that I did ask for people to send in questions that they had to staff ahead of time, so those, those could either be answered before the meeting or staff could bring the relevant information to the table. So if we can try and keep things nice and succinct as we move through these papers, that would be good in terms of our questioning, but also our contributions to debate. So I'll invite up <coughs> Gareth to the table um, to, yeah, to introduce <laughs> item 8.1, Asset Management Plan Cemeteries. On mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, so Mike will pass to you and then... Oh, thanks, Madam Tech. Can I just make a couple of remarks, please? Um, you've got three asset management plans in front of you this morning, um, committee members. We're um, we're not trying to solve through these asset management plans all of the issues related with all of the assets that we're putting in front of you. What we're trying to do is to give you a snapshot of the state of the assets and some of the risks and some of the opportunities. And you've heard, I think, um, as you said quite eloquently from some people about some of those risks and what those opportunities are. Um, Particularly for, for tracks and trails and for beach accesses, we're looking to retrofit a, a management framework and levels of service that we don't currently have. So it gives us a bit of direction on what we do, a bit of direction on what we do and what we don't do, because we don't currently have that at the moment. Uh, it's been quite unclear until today. Now, your, your first one is, is the cemeteries asset management plan. Uh, I, I can see you've got the excellent Trevor, Jen and Gareth in the room to answer any specific questions, but we'll take the report as read and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Kia ora, Mike. Any questions from the table? And to note, too, that the kind of, I guess, direction of travel for this asset management plan has been to the Social Sustainability Subcommittee as well, so it was discussed uh, at their hui. Councillor Pravanov. Oh, sorry, you're still on mute, Councillor Pravanov. Thank you. So, so one of our recommendations obviously is to approve in principle this asset management plan. Um, I, I, it's a really enlightening um, report, so thank you to staff who've put a lot of time and effort into this. But I suppose my key question is, um, I'm just scrolling down to page 39. I'm sorry, 39. When... Um, Basically, what it's saying is demand management, there's a table in there, it says consider capacity planning for one large cemetery for the whole district. I believe that we need more conversations around whether we have one large cemetery or whether we look at the areas that are growing in population. So... Um, why, yeah, so so why is the plan, um, the suggestion to have only one large cemetery? Um, and thanks, where might that be? Oh, thanks, Councillor. So we're not at that point yet. So so that the page you're looking at, the, the uh, um, appendix two, is actually the improvement plan. So that's things that we think we need to think about and bring back to you for further discussion. Mm -hmm. That That is kind of on the horizon, that discussion. As of today, as I think the report says, we, we are looking at... Um, using our existing assets, and indeed we're looking at purchasing more land in Waikanae so we can continue with how we are, um, um, with a current model. But at some stage in the future, and, and probably long after we're gone, Councillor, but at some stage in the future, this is going to become an issue for the district, and we might need to look at, at rationalisation in the same way that uh, Wellington City and Whaurua City have now with Whanua Tapi being the main place for burials in, in, in both of those cities. So um, 
all this is doing is signaling to you that at some point in the future, we need to be thinking about this. We, we aren't yet ready to bring you some any, any advice around where that might be or what that might look like. But in the next 10 years, um, there's a sort of thing that we should be thinking about and, and bringing to you for further advice. But it's not anything that's imminent, um, but it's something that we certainly need to have in the backs of our minds. Over. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for that clarification. I know that Purchase for Land and Mike and I has been um, a subject of conversation for probably a few years now, and I know it's becoming more and more difficult to de decide where because of the land being bought by developers and then developed. So thank you. Kim Tahiwi. Kia ora. Um, just a couple real small questions. Um, so page 15, it says 60 to 70% uh, paid by user fee. Um, and then the figures say capex of 4.7, opex of 4.8, income of 3.5, which is not 60%. Um, so can you explain that? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I could do a little uh, calculation in my head. Um, Kim, I, I think so, so. I don't think the capex is, is amortized, amortized over over decades. So you you, you can't. Oh, so it's over the, opex, is it? Yeah, yeah. So, so and the opex includes the, the cost of capital and depreciation. So yeah, uh, three point five over four point eight is is roughly uh, um roughly yeah. And and the other question I've been asked to um, get clarity on is. What's the definition of a historical cemetery? The, um, the, the three, Madam Chair, if I can just defer that to um, my subject matter expert, Trevor, in the back there. Sorry, just, sorry, yeah, yeah, you're good now. Sorry, yeah, it's one we've been uh, been looking after for a while and we've inherited as well. So it's one that's been it's, it's virtually cl it's, it's been closed and that we've continued the maintenance and um, look at looking after it. So yeah, it's one that's um, been um, that we've that has been closed for some time. So there's four listed in the paper, so are you saying they're all closed? Because if I'm thinking historical cemeteries, I would think Rangiatia would be one of one of the major historical cemeteries of Kapiti District. Um, yeah, so... So those, those four that are listed on the asset management plan are listed on the council website as heritage sites. So they're heritage, it's heritage related when you say historical, yeah. yeah. Andre, back in. Kia ora. Uh, thank you staff for your work uh, to prepare this report. I, I do want to extend the, the conversation further regarding heritage versus historic. It's arguably the most historic heritage site um, is at Rangiatea. Um It's our tuahu. It's where the onetapu that came off the Tainui Waka was placed when the decision made, was made as early as 1844 to construct the church. It has always been on this council's heritage trail. Um, the council has also, in my time as the chair of Rangiatea and as an elected member, provided assistance to us, funding assistance to us, to maintain that urupa, which has no less than, I think, five or six rangatira who signed the treaty. The other urupa of historical or heritage significance is at Pukekraka, and I'm interested to know why we aren't identifying those significant places of heritage interest and historical importance as part of this paper. So just asking the question if we could give that consideration so that we could provide elected members with a more comprehensive, um, um, I guess, uh, perspective on what historical, what heritage looks like. Mm. Yeah, really important point and one, one well made. Thank you, Kōrua. I think Mike Mendonca online. Oh, thanks, Madam Chair. Just, just to make the point that um, this asset management plan is, is focused around assets that the council owns. So I, I think there's a really good quarter and discussion around around the, the wider um, Urupa and, and private cemeteries in the in the in the district. But for the purposes of this paper, we're, we're focused on on the council assets. 
could I just take the liberty then respectfully of ensuring then when we're being when the report has been provided, what it says here, historical cemeteries or Uruka, and then it says a list of known historical cemeteries and Uruka in Kapiti District. It doesn't quantify the relationship between the council and those Urupa or those cemeteries that have been identified. If reference is going to be made to Urupa, I would respectfully ask that we identify them and then the paper might decide how it wants to explain the relationship between an Urupa and this council, whether it's managing it or whether it's just simply recognising it. So that's potentially something we can look to do before we, you know, hundred as, as kind of almost an editorial conversation, potentially, as to how that's reflected. And as you say, the terminology used, Urupa, um, how we, yeah, how we better ensure that the, the, the conversation and the take that you're raising is, yeah, is reflected, Andre. So, yeah, we'll follow that up. Does that sound okay, Mike? Yeah. Right. Thank you, Andre. Okay, cool. Kia ora. Any other questions? Councillor Wilson. <coughs> Councillor Wilson, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I did. That's oh. it. Um, just to the point that Andre was making, and uh, prior to that, Kim, uh, I think one of the reasons, I, I know this is a focus on council owned assets, but other assets that do the same job, it's really important to be accounting for those, um, but for no other reason than capacity. To deal, you know, in, in terms of cemeteries and Urupa, uh, they all deal with the same thing, somewhere to put dead people, right? So the Urupa is very, very important in terms of um, the ability for capacity, to take capacity. So I'm assuming that they will all be factored in even though they are not, and any other private cemeteries, if, if there happen to be any, I don't know if there are or not, but any of those things, because they impact on what on what councils own facilities as well. Thanks, Councillor Wilson. Councillor Provanov, just, just one quick question, because I'm aware that you have already... Yes, yeah, so on page 29, there is a, um, it says a future demand graph there, and so just so that I can understand how this works, so for example, can you add the two percentages and why can I east and why can I beach together? And why can I west? Yep, sorry, Jocelyn, we're just figuring out who's going to answer that question for you. I think clear. Y yes, that can be done. <laughs> yep, that yep, can yep, be done. Yep. So my other qu very quick question is, can people actually purchase, in terms of demand, can people actually purchase um, plots in advance and so they are taken into consideration when this demand is actually being um, established, future demand? Um, yes, it can be. It, it's done on a case-by-case -case basis for any pre-purchasing of plots, but um, yeah, we do take that into consideration moving forward as well in, into these figures. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Pravanov. Seeing as there are no other questions, I think Councillor Halliday has indicated that he would be happy yep, to happy move. To move it, Madam Chair. Mm. Can I get a seconder? Councillor Coford? Cool. Right of introduction. Oh. Yes, I will use that. Thank you, Madam oh, Chair. Sorry, sorry. One brief thing, Councillor Halliday, before you do so. As I mentioned briefly before, we're seeking to add at the end of recommendation B, so improves in principle the asset management plan is basis for long-term planning and notes that no decisions with financial implications are being made today. Are you happy with that minor amendment? Cool. Councillor Coford, you're also happy as the seconder? Yes, All right, over to you for your right of introduction. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, look, fantastic. Great, great to see you, you chaps again and uh, thank you for coming through the um, our committee there as well. Uh, look, I just wanted, one of the things I wanted to highlight um, that Mike mentioned was this is a retrofit um, with regards to and, and a level of, uh, with regards to the level of service and a process. Um, so um, I'm not going to go into why we don't have one or we haven't had them in the past. The simple fact of the matter is we are addressing it. 
Um, so, Andre, taking your comments on board, this is a building document, um, I dare say, so thank you very much for bringing that up um, and that sort of stuff, and I'm sure it's been taken on board as part of that process um, around all this. I uh, also wanted to highlight that we are looking at a new symmetry management system as well, um, being implemented in 2024, and I've made, I make co general comment here, that, and I've made it before, that it's great to see these asset management plans coming through. I mean, the reasons we had the situation, we've got the library with the... Um, the community centre was, was, I just don't think we had effective ones in place at that stage. Not into the rights or wrongs, it's all history. Uh, but it's fantastic to see that we are putting these things in place now. It's as part of prudent management and it also helps extend the life of our assets and make sure that our community gets to enjoy these assets uh, to the maximum of their ability. So um, I know we've got a couple more asset management plans, but just great to see them coming through. And I just want to thank you all for the um, effort and foresight and um, work that's gone into making this uh, actually a reality. Awesome. Thanks, Councillor Halliday. Nice and succinct and covered a lot of bases with that. So, yeah, echo the thanks also to the staff for the enormous amount of mahi. Any other comments from the table? There don't seem to be anything, so presuming you don't want to write a reply, Councillor Halliday, perfect. So, recommendations on page 7A and the slightly amended B. All those in favour? Aye. Against? That's carried. Thank you. Thanks, team. So we'll, what's our time? How are people feeling? A quick five minute stretch of the legs? Yeah, cool. So we'll come back at, we'll come back at quarter past 11. So you've got 12 minutes.